A Unidade Nacional de Capacitação do Conselho Nacional do Ministério Público, em conjunto com o Conselho Nacional de Justiça e a Escola Superior da Advocacia, realizam hoje um debate importante. O tema interessa a toda a sociedade, aos membros do Ministério Público Brasileiro, à magistratura, à advocacia e a todos os operadores do direito. Nós vamos abordar o caso George Floyd. E se fosse no Brasil? A discussão vai trazer o julgamento recente, ocorrido no último dia 19 de 4 de 2021, em que o policial Derek Chauvin, acusado de assassinar George Floyd, foi julgado nos Estados Unidos. O tema ganhou repercussão mundial, porque debate assuntos importantes, como os direitos humanos, o racismo, a atividade policial e a violência. Por isso, traz contextos e discussões que interessam a todos os brasileiros. O tema também assume relevância no país em razão do fato de que o Congresso Nacional está debatendo uma reformulação do Código de Processo Penal no Brasil, discutindo temas sensíveis como o Tribunal do Júri e algumas limitações na atividade investigativa. Para discutir esse tema hoje, nós temos convidados também especiais. Nós vamos receber a professora Shannon Gardner, que é da Universidade de Syracuse que também foi procuradora criminal federal no Distrito Central da Califórnia, portanto, muito próxima desse caso. Nós vamos receber também o professor Renato Brasileiro, que é promotor de justiça militar da União em São Paulo e também é autor de diversas obras nesta área. Bom, para contribuir com a nossa discussão, nós temos também alguns convidados importantes. Vamos receber o doutor Samuel Alvarenga, que é promotor de justiça no estado de Rondônia, e também o doutor Brian Sampaio, que é advogado. Ambos também estudaram e estudam na Universidade de Syracuse. Bom, para contribuir com o nosso debate, então, eu passo a palavra ao doutor Samuel, que será responsável pela nossa mediação de hoje. Mas, desde já, agradecendo aos nossos participantes, sejam todos bem-vindos, agradecendo à professora Gardner e ao professor Renato Brasileiro, que, com certeza, irão nos ensinar muito nesse encontro de hoje. Então, sejam todos bem-vindos e, desde já, eu agradeço, então, pela contribuição na realização desse evento de hoje. Doutor Samuel, a palavra é sua. Conselheira Fernanda Marinello, muito obrigado pela, pela oportunidade. É uma oportunidade para todos nós, de fato, aprendermos muito sobre o sistema americano, o sistema de júri americano, e com isso a gente poder trazer algumas reflexões para o Brasil, neste momento que é tão importante, nesse momento de amadurecer de amadurecer o sistema o processual penal o brasileiro. né? Gostaria de agradecer a todas e a todos por essa por este momento, e especialmente a professora Gardner, que se dispôs né, a contribuir conosco aqui é, para mais este evento. O professora Gardner, o nosso evento vai ser extremamente dinâmico. né? Nós iremos fazer, através do, do professor Renato Brasileiro, que é um grande autor aqui no Brasil de processo criminal, é, várias perguntas para a senhora em um estudo de comparação entre o sistema americano e o sistema brasileiro. É, com, é, com essa dinâmica, através de uma série de perguntas e de, de respostas, isso permitirá uma, uma maior interação entre todos nós. Nós iremos tentar cobrir alguns temas, pelo menos sete ou oito temas aqui, envolvendo esse recentíssimo julgamento envolvendo o assassinato de George Floyd nos Estados Unidos, na cidade de, de Minneapolis, no ano, no ano passado. O professor, então, para a gente... Para que a gente possa começar o nosso evento, eu gostaria de pedir à senhora, inicialmente, para fazer uma breve explicação sobre o caso, né, todos os pontos que, que cobriram o caso do julgamento envolvendo a morte de George Floyd, como foi o sistema de seleção de júri, né, e especialmente, o professor Agarten, é, o júri para a, o povo americano, o povo americano possui uma relação muito especial com o sistema de júri, seja em casos de em casos civis, seja em casos o, o criminais. Então, nós gostaríamos também que a senhora explicasse para a gente um pouco como que é essa relação, essa herança do direito inglês nos Estados Unidos sobre o sistema de júri. O professor Agarja, a palavra é toda sua. Muito obrigado. 
Thank you, Samuel, and thank you to everyone for having me today. I'm so pleased to be here and to have this dialogue with all of you. Um, beginning with Samuel's question regarding the American jury system, it is a system that has very deep roots in the United States. The right to jury trial in our criminal cases is embedded in the Sixth Amendment to our Constitution. And in civil cases, where there is also a right to jury trial, in most instances, that is likewise embedded in our Constitution in the Seventh Amendment. Similarly, each of our 50 states has a constitution and, um, and they similarly provide for a right to jury trial. Um, the, the right to jury trial uh, at the time that our country was drafting our constitution, so at the time that our country was just coming into existence, the right to jury trial held very deep significance because the colonists who at that time believed that they were being subjected to a tyranny by the rule of Great Britain and the king, um, the colonists in uh, many instances would gather as a jury for a criminal case and refuse to convict a defendant for violation of an English law. So even though there was sufficient evidence of guilt, the, the colonists would not convict. And so those are just a very sort of brief glimpse into the, the, the roots of our jury system. And continuing to this day, more than 230 years later, we, we treasure the role of jurors in our system. Jurors may serve in almost all courts simply if they are an adult that is over the age of 18. Um, no particular uh, training or expertise is required. Indeed, some may have very little education they are really just members of the community. Um, what we hope is a, what we call a cross section of the community. So uh, a group of individuals that is on a smaller scale representative of the larger community. Um, and they gather together to render verdicts that is based on the instructions of law that the judge provides them to deliberate and determine if a particular charge or civil claim is satisfied. And, and the role of the jurors in, in our system is treasured because we believe it allows the public uh, citizens to really have a say in what the law is. So the, the judicial branch of our governments, both federal and state, while it is comprised primarily of courts and judges and certainly attorneys operating in those courts, the jury system allows members of the public and citizens to have an active role in that branch. Um, so it's something that is that is very uh, prized, very valued in the American system. Professora Garner, bom, bom dia. dia. Bom dia, conselheiro Marinella, Samuel, Vladimir, Brian, Diego, todos os colegas envolvidos. Dizer que é uma grande satisfação participar do evento. E, professora Garner, gostaria de fazer alguns questionamentos à senhora envolvendo aí, então, o julgamento do, do, do caso Chauvin, né, do, da morte do George Floyd. A, a primeira pergunta, professora Gardner, é sobre a investigação policial, porque tivemos um caso envolvendo um crime cometido por policiais, então a nossa curiosidade, sobretudo para comparar com o sistema brasileiro, seriam duas perguntas 
que eu gostaria de fazer à senhora. Primeiro, essa investigação por envolver um policial, ela pode ser feita pela própria polícia? Ou será que, nesse caso, essa investigação seria feita pelo Ministério Público? Seria a primeira pergunta que eu gostaria de fazer à senhora. A segunda pergunta, professora Gardner, seria se os elementos, as, a, em inglês, né, as evidências produzidas nessa fase investigatória podem amanhã ser aproveitadas no tribunal do júri. E eu pergunto isso à senhora porque no projeto do novo Código de Processo Criminal, ora em tramitação no Congresso Nacional Brasileiro, há uma previsão de que essas evidências colhidas na fase investigatória não poderiam ser usadas no júri. Thank you very much. Um, turning to your first question regarding the investigation, that is a, um, a sometimes challenging matter when there are police officers who are subjects or targets of an investigation. Certainly no officers who work with Officer Chauvin would, or the other officers, would have been involved in the investigation. The investigation would have been conducted by um, different state investigators. We also in the United States have a dual system involving federal authorities and state authorities. And it has been made public that the federal authorities, that is the Department of Justice, is investigating these four officers. And it is anticipated that federal authorities will return criminal charges, likely involving civil rights violations against these four officers. So we have concurrent investigations happening by both state authorities and by federal authorities. But as regards the state authorities, it's a, it's a different office than the particular department in which these officers worked. E, professora Garner, quanto ao segundo questionamento, se essas evidências colhidas, produzidas durante a investigação, podem ser usadas lá no julgamento, no trial jury do caso? Yes, and as to your second question, um, the, the rules of evidence that exist in our courts, so... For the federal courts, we have a federal rules of evidence. For the state courts, state courts either voluntarily adopt the federal rules of evidence or draft their own rules of evidence. Those rules of evidence largely apply in the context of trials. So for example, the rule against hearsay, for instance, right? that is an out of court statement offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Generally, that is inadmissible. That is a limitation on trial evidence. So in the context of preliminary hearings in a case, typically those rules of evidence do not apply. And then certainly, in the context of what we call discovery, that is the exchange of information between the parties um, at the earlier stages of a case. Um, certainly the rules of evidence do not apply in that context. So what must be produced, for instance, by the prosecution to a defendant early in a case is much, much broader than certainly what might be admitted into evidence later before the jury. And in criminal cases, 
particularly because there are certain constitutional rights of a criminal defendant. In criminal cases, the requirements as to what must be disclosed between the parties derive largely from constitutional rights of a defendant. So they, those obligations are dictated by the Constitution, court cases interpreting the Constitution, and statute, particular provisions of our uh, federal rules of criminal procedure or the state counterpart if it is in a state court. Muito obrigado, professora Gardner. Uh, professora Gardner, continuando com a, as, os questionamentos, as perguntas, uma outra questão que eu gostaria de perguntar à senhora é sobre a possibilidade do Chauvin, em um caso como esse de homicídio, fazer um acordo, os chamados guilty pleas. Gostaria que a senhora uh, falasse sobre esses acordos, o percentual, se num crime de homicídio, esse acordo poderia ser celebrado, porque no Brasil, e só para fazer essa comparação para a senhora, esses acordos ainda são relativamente novos. Ah, tivemos uma mudança legislativa em 2019 e agora a possibilidade de celebração desses acordos foi ampliada. Então, gostaria que a senhora fizesse uma breve, um breve relato sobre esses acordos, os limites, os percentuais e, principalmente, professora, o quanto que esses acordos contribuem para uma justiça mais efetiva, mais célere e mais eficaz. Yes, well, I have been fortunate to hear from some of my Brazilian students regarding plea agreements in Brazil and your practices. And, and from that, I have learned that in the United States, we have uh, much broader practices with regard to plea agreements and many, many more cases in the United States are resolved by plea agreement. With regard to the breadth, there is no limitation on what type of case or what charge can be resolved by plea agreement. Any criminal case uh, could, could potentially be resolved by plea agreement. We consider it, that is the plea agreement, we consider it almost in the nature of a private contract between the, pro the particular prosecutor's office and the particular defendant. Right? So even though ultimately, if a defendant pursuant to a plea agreement offers a guilty plea to the court, pleads guilty for an offense, the particular agreements between the prosecutor's office and the, and the defendant Are, are not subject to limitation by the court. There is no involvement by the court in the discussions, nor in the, nego in the ultimate agreement that is reached. Um, so it, it is available for any criminal charge in the United States. And in fact, studies vary, but the vast, vast majority of criminal cases in the United States that result in a conviction, something like 98% or so of criminal cases that result in a conviction are the result of a plea agreement. So it is something that is, is used often in our criminal system. Muito obrigado, professora Gardner. É, gostaria de perguntar à senhora na sequência sobre a possibilidade, no caso Chauvin, de condenações múltiplas. 
se ele pode ser condenado por mais que um crime ou se seria apenas por um delito, a depender da presença ou não do elemento subjetivo, da vontade de cometer o delito. Só para fazer uma comparação, professora, no nosso sistema, se o indivíduo é condenado pelo crime de homicídio doloso, simples, qualificado, ele não responde por outros delitos, como homicídio culposo, lesão corporal, porque se entende que o delito mais grave teria o condão de teria o poder de absorver o crime menos grave. Então gostaria de perguntar à senhora sobre essa possibilidade de condenações múltiplas. Yes, well, uh, that's a that's a very interesting question. In the American system, homicide, that is the killing of another, is divided in our jurisdictions between murder and manslaughter. But then further within those divisions, there are more discrete crimes, various degrees of murder, for instance, or various degrees of manslaughter. There is no prohibition on a defendant being convicted of multiple different crimes for murder or manslaughter. And we do not consider it duplicative because each of the offenses has a slight difference, at least as to one particular requirement. So, There is, there is no legal bar to conviction for these multiple offenses because technically we don't consider them duplicative. Now, I will say two things. Number one, with regard to why we would charge multiple offenses, right? So if Officer Chauvin is believed to have committed murder, why would he be charged with manslaughter, for instance? Right? Well, if a prosecutor's office does not have certainty that he will be convicted of the more serious charge, then the prosecutor's office may decide to also pursue the lesser charge so that if there is either a hung jury for murder or an acquittal for murder, there at least hopefully would be a conviction for a lesser offense. So it is, to our mind, this is a horrible word to say, but it is, it is a tactical decision to our mind. And further, those same concerns apply on appeal. So perhaps once Officer Chauvin is convicted, he appeals the conviction and raises legal challenges. Well, if one of the charges is reversed on appeal, having those other charges that may or may not be affected by the particular legal challenge allows that ultimate conviction perhaps to still stand. So there are tactical decisions both for the trial and for appeal as regards why one would pursue multiple offenses. Um, now, at sentencing, Right? So in our system, it is the court, the judge, who imposes sentence. At sentencing, these various crimes would result in what we call concurrent sentences. So only in particular instances, if a statute provides for a consecutive sentence, does one serve the sentence um, on top of a prior sentence. So in this instance, even though there are two murder convictions and one manslaughter conviction, the sentences for each of those crimes, Officer Chauvin would serve concurrently. So he would end up serving ultimately in prison only the length of the greatest sentence. Mm -hmm. 
Muito obrigado, professora Gardner. O nosso colega Samuel já tinha falado entre nós que a senhora seria uma, uma excelente professora, uma professora muito didática, mas realmente é impressionante a, a qualidade e a facilidade com que a senhora consegue aí nos expor em tão pouco tempo todas essas diferenças em relação ao sistema americano. Dando o prosseguimento aos questionamentos, professora Gardner, gostaria de perguntar para a senhora sobre a questão da liberdade ou prisão do Chauvin após o crime e durante o julgamento. A questão da fiança, da liberdade e por quê? No sistema brasileiro, de acordo com a nova orientação da nossa Suprema Corte, essa prisão dele só poderia ocorrer depois do, do, do fim de todos os recursos cabíveis. Quando não coubesse mais nenhum recurso, aí ele poderia ser preso, salvo em situações excepcionais, se estivesse ameaçando testemunhas, ameaçando fugir. Então, gostaria de perguntar para a senhora qual é o momento em que ele é preso. Ele é preso durante as investigações, depois da, da conclusão do grand jury, ou se ele aguarda o julgamento de todos os recursos? Your, your question raises a few different issues in the American system. Um, first, with regard to the arrest of a defendant. In the American system, that may occur after a grand jury has concluded its investigation and deliberation and returned formal charges against a suspect, now a defendant, or depending the speed with which a, a crime needs to be investigated and the speed with which one needs to be arrested or taken off the street, right? that arrest may occur before the grand jury has concluded its investigation. And when that happens, that is when arrest occurs first, there are strict time limits as to when particular things must be done in the case. If a suspect is arrested without any charges, perhaps I'm robbing a bank and the teller calls for police and they chase me down the street. Well, in that instance, there is a limited time period, usually of 48 or 72 hours, during which informal charges, a criminal complaint must be returned and then a grand jury indictment can be returned some short time later, usually depending the jurisdiction, it must be returned within 20 or 30 days. Um, now, as to bail, so when someone is arrested, is that person released pending trial or pending sentencing after conviction? Or is that person detained in the custody of police, that is a subject of a hearing before the court. The particular judge determines whether bail, that is release upon certain conditions, whether release is appropriate in a particular case. And in most jurisdictions, it is um, guided, though not ultimately determined, by statutory provisions. So for example, in most jurisdictions, the federal jurisdiction included, there is a statute that provides for most offenses for a presumption of bail. So in, for most offenses, we presume that someone will be released. For, for very serious offenses, there could be, uh, such as violent crimes, there could be a presumption of detention. But in either instance, that those are merely presumptions. The court determines at a hearing if a defendant will be released, and if so, 
on what conditions the defendant will be released. The two factors that are um, used to guide the court's decision are number one, flight risk. Is this defendant going to appear for trial and later court appearances, or is the defendant going to abscond from the jurisdiction? So flight risk is uh, the first primary factor. And then the second factor is danger to the community. If this individual is released, will the individual continue to commit crimes? Um, will the individual attempt to harm or intimidate witnesses? So what, what is the danger to the community of this individual is released? And those things we believe in certain cases can be mitigated um, or managed by setting certain conditions of bail. So for example, a very common condition of bail is if, an, if a defendant is released, that defendant cannot leave the jurisdiction, right? So in Officer Chauvin's case, could not go outside the county or the state. That condition of his bail that was originally set was modified by the court when it appeared to the court that his own, Officer Chauvin's own safety might be at risk. So he was permitted to reside outside of the jurisdiction and he was permitted to not have a known permanent address because even though those are normally conditions, the court believed that it might endanger his safety. Um, further, there are often monetary conditions of bail that are set. And in the American system, this is something that particularly recently has, um, has been widely debated and criticized because the view is that it provides for disparate treatment depending one's economic status. But often conditions in, of bail involve the posting of a residence or property that is of a particular value or the posting of a monetary bail, which was in Officer Chauvin's case. And further, our state systems, not our federal system, but our state systems use commercial bail bondsmen, which are private companies that will produce to the court uh, bail in the full amount in exchange for the payment by the defendant of 10% of the bail. So I believe Officer Chauvin's bail was set at $1 million. He would pay to a commercial bail bondsman, a private company, $100,000. And in exchange for that, the private company would produce a surety to the court attesting that if Officer Chauvin flees or does not comply with his conditions of bail, that company will be liable for the full $1 million. Oh, and I apologize. Your question also concerned, um, so once Officer Chauvin was convicted, he, is he was remanded into custody. His bail was revoked. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is twofold. Number one, to the extent that there was not a presumption uh, of detention in the first instance, if there was a presumption of bail, often jurisdictions change that presumption once there is a criminal conviction. And further, the court's calculation of how danger and flight weigh in the balance, that calculation often changes once there is a criminal conviction. Now, we do not have an individual who is presumed innocent. Now we have a, an individual who is a convicted murderer. So that conviction by the jury often changes the court's calculation. Similarly as to flight risk, not, not just danger, but similarly as to flight risk, well, 
perhaps if I'm a defendant, I think maybe I'll stay for trial and maybe I'll I'll get acquitted or have a hung jury. But once I'm convicted and now the chances have that I'm going to prison are substantially increased, maybe that changes how much I might be willing to risk to flee. So that conviction and the fact that he is now awaiting sentencing and not merely awaiting trial, it changes the calculation in the bail determination that the court makes. Perfeito, professora Gardner. Muito boa a, a explicação da senhora. É, professora Gardner, dando prosseguimento aos questionamentos, é, gostaria que a senhora falasse um pouco até pelo que a senhora já disse, sobre essas três fases aí do processo criminal do Chauvin. Porque a senhora faz referência primeiro ao Grand Jury, depois a senhora faz referência ao Trial Jury, e depois a senhora faz referência, acabou de falar, sobre um momento posterior no qual ele seria sentenciado. Então, só para fazer a comparação... Aqui no Brasil, nós temos também uma primeira fase em casos aí de homicídios dolosos em que o processo tramita perante um juiz e não perante os jurados. Temos uma segunda fase, onde aí sim o processo vai para o julgamento perante os jurados e no sistema criminal brasileiro, a sentença já é proferida no dia do julgamento pelo júri, pelos jurados. E essa pergunta, principalmente sobre essas fases, professora Gardner, também é importante, porque no projeto do nosso novo Código de Processo Criminal, que está em tramitação no Congresso Nacional, há uma discussão quanto à possibilidade de extinção, de se abolir essa primeira fase. O julgamento, então, iria direto para o julgamento em plenário do júri. Então, gostaria que a senhora falasse sobre essas três fases, o Grand Jury, o Trial Jury e depois o momento do, da, da sentença. Yes. Um, so, in the American system, the right to indictment by grand jury is something that is embedded in our Constitution, in a separate provision, the Fifth Amendment, But just as there is a right to jury trial uh, in many instances, there is a right to indictment by grand jury for felony offenses. So for offenses in most jurisdictions, that would be an offense for which there is a possible sentence of one year or more in prison. That is normally what defines a felony or more serious offense. There is a right to grand jury in those instances. Grand juries in the American system really fulfill two, uh, two different roles, uh, though those roles interplay and work together. Grand juries perform an investigative function. So grand juries have the power of subpoena, which of course is guided by a prosecutor who is working with the grand jury. But those subpoenas can require a witness to appear and produce documents or a witness to appear and testify. Uh, so it serves um, an important investigative function in our system. Maybe if the police or federal agents come to interview me because I'm a witness to a crime, maybe I don't want to talk to them. Maybe I refuse to speak to them. Well, if I'm subpoenaed to testify before a grand jury, I must speak, right? subject only to if anything I say might incriminate myself for a crime or if there's some other privilege, perhaps a spousal privilege or something like that. So we can compel witnesses to speak before the grand jury to testify and we can compel production of documents and other things. So the grand jury performs an important investigative role, um, but then there is also separately the constitutional function that is an accusatory role. 
And that is determining whether there is sufficient evidence to return particular felony charges against particular defendants. Um, in our system, grand juries are composed just, even though they're entirely separate from trial juries, they're composed just as we would compose trial juries. So they are members of the community. They have no particular training or experience. You know, one must be over the age of 18, um, usually not convicted of a prior felony offense. So perhaps if one has a criminal record, that might exclude one. But there are very minimal requirements because we consider it an important community function and we want the grand jury to represent a broad cross-section of the community. Now, once a criminal case has commenced in court, there are some functions of a judge that, that sound similar or akin to what you mentioned regarding the Brazilian system. So we have hearings, preliminary hearings before a court, and sometimes a court is required to find whether there is sufficient evidence, uh, sort of a minimum threshold of evidence against a defendant to permit the case to proceed. But in most of our jurisdictions, those preliminary hearings are obviated. They are not held if the grand jury has returned an indictment because the grand jury has already found that that threshold standard of probable cause is satisfied. So it obviates the need for any preliminary hearing before the court. So most often in our criminal cases, those pre-trial hearings before the judge are focused on, well, certainly bail in the first instance, perhaps some issues regarding discovery, what are the parties required to exchange, um, and further any constitutional challenges to evidence. Perhaps I allege that evidence was seized in violation of my right to a search warrant or something like that. So what we call motions to suppress evidence. So those uh, hearings, which really do not go to the, the evidence uh, uh, comprising the charges, those sort of related matters regarding admission of evidence, the conduct of the trial. In the Chauvin case, there were motions to move the venue, move it to another court. There were motions to bifurcate or separate the trials of the various officers, and that was granted. The trial of Officer Chauvin was separated from the trial of the other three defendants, even though they were charged together. So those sorts of hearings are what would comprise most of the court's time before trial. And then if a case does proceed to trial, then the jury is impaneled. That can take quite a while. The process of jury selection is rather involved, rather time consuming in the American system because each party, both the prosecution and the defense, have a right to challenge or excuse jurors, sometimes for cause, sometimes if a juror perhaps evinces uh, bias or an ability not to be impartial. Right? But more often, those challenges are what we call peremptory challenges. Each side has the opportunity to dismiss a prospective juror for no reason at all. So that process of jury selection can be quite involved. Um, we impanel not just 12 jurors, but we also impanel alternates who sit and hear all of the evidence. So if for some reason a juror falls ill or needs to be excused, then those alternates are ready to assume that juror's place and trial does not need to begin anew again. Um, so. So that's really, I think, sort of the basic division for us between the the role of the grand jury and then the if there is a jury trial in the case, the role of the judge before trial versus the jury during the trial. The judges in our 
criminal cases, even when there is a right to jury trial and even when a jury trial occurs, the judges in our criminal cases retain authority to rule that there is not a sufficient minimum amount of evidence met. So before trial or even after trial, a judge could rule that the prosecution has not produced sufficient evidence from which any reasonable jury could return a conviction. So the judge retains that authority and could in some instances even um, uh, dismiss a jury's conviction for that reason. But it is, it is meant to be, and it is in practice, a very limited authority and almost a gatekeeping, what we call a gatekeeping function to, to uh, eliminate those cases in which the evidence is so slight that the court believes the prosecution should not be allowed to proceed. Perfeito. Professora Gade, o professor Renato, queria pedir licença para o senhor, o professor Agardner. Eu acho que uma, 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 aqui uma das perguntas também que o professor Renato fez e que nos intriga aqui é, no nosso sistema brasileiro é, é por que que após a condenação pelo assassinato, o juiz ele, ele suspende o julgamento e aí ele tem um período para ele poder meditar, para ele poder refletir sobre a, a aplicação da, da pena. Por que, que essa fase ela é importante, esse período? E até aproveitando, o professor Renato, se existe alguma possibilidade de, apesar da condenação pelos três crimes, de ele receber penas apenas por um ou parte dos crimes? E se existe um limite né, um limite máximo aí, como não foi pedida a pena de, de, a, a pena de morte, né? se existe algum limite aí em termos de encarceramento para o, o condenado. Né? Yes, in the American system, the, the, the sentencing phase of proceedings takes quite a while and is a very involved phase of proceedings. This occurs actually not just when there is a conviction by jury or a conviction at trial, but even in the instance of a guilty plea, the, the sentencing phase involves investigation and briefing and some significant period of time by the court. In the federal system, there is a branch of the court called the pre-trial services office. They are um, staff of the court. And in connection with sentencing, they prepare a sentencing report for the court. They go out and interview family members and they interview victims and they investigate the defendant's criminal history, not just convictions, but prior arrests or unresolved charges. It's a very lengthy report that's prepared um, for the court. And even in state systems that do not have that branch of the court, the parties themselves often undertake to do those things and they file briefs and other submissions with the court, victim statements, um, statements of the defendant's family members, things like this. Um, so sentencing is something that requires a lot of preparation and briefing, both by the court and by the parties. In terms of sentences that are actually imposed, every offense in the particular statute that provides for the offense, every statute has a maximum term of imprisonment. There are a few, but very few offenses that have mandatory minimum terms of imprisonment. Usually it is just a maximum term that is set. Now that often provides a vast range of possible sentences. In this instance, for, for instance, for Officer Chauvin, 
if the murder conviction carries a possible maximum sentence of 40 years, well, really all that means is the judge can go no higher than 40 years. The judge could sentence from zero to 40 years in prison. So they set a, a cap or limitation, but that still results in a very broad range. And so most jurisdictions have adopted uh, guidelines or um, provisions that provide for the court a suggested term or sometimes a suggested range of uh, months imprisonment. Right? And those things, that is the calculation of that suggested term, those things are based on uh, particular qualities of the crime itself. Um, for instance, if I commit a fraud offense, did I victimize two people or 1,000 people? Did I defraud for $100,000 or a million dollars? You know, if it's a drug offense, often the quantity of drugs involved guides determination. So these sorts of things for murder or manslaughter, particular qualities of the offense, if it was particularly depraved or if there uh, was, was planning or some other aggravating circumstances. So circumstances of the crime itself often guide the suggested uh, or guidelines range, but other things as well, a defendant's uh, history and background, not just a defendant's criminal history, though certainly that does guide things, um, but uh, a defendant's other sort of uh, qualities and history in the defendant's background. That uh, suggested term of imprisonment, which for the murder convictions in this case is 12 and a half years in prison, um, that suggested term of imprisonment or range is just a guideline for the court. So the court can... Uh, uh, go below that or go above it, what the court needs to find to do that. So what the court needs to find to depart lower or higher depends upon the particular jurisdiction. But most often it is a very flexible standard. You know, in, in any instance, a court could possibly find exceptional or extraordinary circumstances because each crime is individual, you know? So the, the departure from that suggested term of imprisonment is permissible and really quite frankly, depends upon uh, the judge herself or himself, you know, what, is this judge a more lenient sentencer or, or a more uh, a strict sentencer? So it depends on the judge. Uh, perhaps I shouldn't say that, but, but it's true. It depends on the particular judge. And it depends really on the particular unique circumstances of the case. So um, I would say more often than not in our criminal cases, that suggested term of imprisonment or range is followed, but it's not always followed. We see departures below and above it with some frequency as well. Muito obrigado, professora Gardner. É, não sei se ainda posso, se temos tempo aí para prosseguir. É, eu teria um, um último questionamento, até por questões de tempo, professora, é, que nos interessa muito é a questão de, de recursos. Se, se no caso Chauvin, por exemplo, se ele pode recorrer, se os recursos seriam direcionados apenas à corte estadual de Minnesota, se ele poderia recorrer para a Supreme Court e assim por diante. E também, professora, se esses recursos poderiam ser interpostos tanto pela acusação, não é o caso, porque ele foi condenado, mas imaginando que ele tivesse sido absolvido, se a acusação poderia recorrer. E no caso concreto, 
como ele foi condenado, se ele pode recorrer. E eu pergunto isso, professora, só para traçar um paralelo com o sistema brasileiro, porque no Brasil, quando alguém é levado a julgamento por homicídio perante o tribunal do júri, essa pessoa pode recorrer. Só que a nossa Corte Suprema tem adotado uma orientação em alguns julgados que, a depender do fundamento da absolvição, no caso, seria uma pergunta aos jurados, ao ah, jurado absolve o acusado, a acusação não poderia recorrer jamais contra essa decisão. Então, gostaria uhum. de, de ter uma breve noção da senhora sobre esse sistema recursal. Yes. So, in the American system, if a defendant is acquitted by a jury, then there can be no appeal of that. And the technical reason for that in the American system is that even if the prosecution was successful on appeal, showed that there was some legal error in the trial, the reversal of the acquittal would still not result in a retrial for that same offense because the double jeopardy clause would bar retrial for the same offense. So an acquittal in a criminal case, for whatever reason, you know, even if, for instance, um, jury nullification occurs, so that is an instance when the jury renders a verdict that appears to everyone to be contrary to the clear weight of the evidence. So, and some believe that happened, for instance, in the O.J. Simpson murder case. You know, here is a man whose DNA was found at the scene and he had a motive and he had an opportunity, right? Any prosecutors here listening to this could go on and on about their, why there was evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. He was acquitted of murder. And so some would say that was jury nullification. In the American system, regardless, there can be no appeal from an acquittal. Um, now, in terms of other appeals that can be taken, the prosecution can appeal the sentence. There is no bar on appeal of a sentence. And the defendant, of course, can appeal any conviction and further any sentence. In most instances, there, there is a practice that is permitted in some jurisdiction that allows for a negotiated waiver of the right to appeal in a plea agreement. So um, uh, even though the defendant's entry of a guilty plea, the admission of guilt under oath, would bar appeal of that conviction, in instances of a guilty plea, there still is possibility of appeal of a sentence. And in some jurisdictions, the parties may negotiate a waiver of appeal of the sentence. But accepting that, a defendant has a right to appeal the conviction, if there is a conviction, and has the right to appeal the sentence, and the government has the right to appeal the sentence. In all of our 51 court systems, that is the federal system and all 50 states, we have a three-level court system. So we have the trial court in which cases must commence and in which decisions and verdicts are rendered. We have the intermediate court of appeals, and we see the function of those courts as correcting any legal errors that occurred in the trial court and ensuring consistent application of the law. So as between the various trial courts in that jurisdiction, rules are being applied consistently. And then after that intermediate uh, set of appellate courts, there is in every jurisdiction one highest court, a state Supreme Court, or in the federal system, the U United States Supreme Court. So in any appeal, one would need to proceed through these various levels. One cannot jump to a highest court in any instance. Um, there is a right to appeal once as a matter of right. So, 
a defendant or the prosecution could appeal to that intermediate appellate court. There is no right for further review by the highest court of a jurisdiction. That highest court must accept the case. So in the, in the United States Supreme Court, we call it a petition for cert or a petition for certiorari. The parties brief to the court why this is an appropriate case for the highest court to consider. Um, so uh, Officer Chauvin can and no likely, uh, in all likelihood will appeal to the intermediate state court if, if he wishes to have further review, if it's not resolved to his satisfaction at the intermediate court, he could seek review by the highest court. Once a state court system has fully concluded a case, there is no right to go to the federal courts or particularly the United States Supreme Court, except to the extent that an issue of federal constitutional law is raised. So if Officer Chauvin raises as part of his challenges an issue under the due process clause to the Fifth Amendment, say, once he has concluded all of his remedies under the state court system, he could seek review by the United States Supreme Court. Uh, but again, review by that court would be in the court's discretion, and the Supreme Court accepts very, very few cases for uh, review each year. Professora Gardner, perfeitas as explicações. Eu, eu indago aí ao nosso colega Samuel se, se posso dar prosseguimento. Claro, professor Renato. E... O debate está muito interessante e eu até queria aproveitar também, professor Renato, pegar carona aí na, nas suas perguntas e pedir licença também à conselheira para fazer uma, uma, uma pergunta que nos interessa muito, o professor Agárdia. Eu queria que a senhora explicasse para a gente se antes de começar o julgamento né, perante o júri né, em casos criminais, quais são os limites ou quais são os poderes que o acusado tem para o produzir provas, né? Se existe algo, né? A gente sabe que que existe uma fase no direito americano que antes de se iniciar o julgamento, as partes, tanto a acusação quanto a defesa, elas efetivamente efetivamente podem o produzir com uma série de, de, de provas, de, de evidências e fazer a solicitação de algumas medidas, né? Que é o que nós o poderíamos mais ou menos o traduzir com uma investigação feito pela pela defesa técnica aqui no Brasil. Então, eu gostaria de saber se a sua a sua visão uhum. no sistema americano, como que essa essa produção de prova pela defesa antes de se começar o julgamento, como que isso ocorre, quais são os limites e quais são os poderes é, nessa fase? In the American system there are obligations of the parties to disclose evidence, um, disclose what they did in the course of their investigation. But those obligations are defined in most jurisdictions by statute um, and with some uh, influence by constitutional provisions and court decisions uh, interpreting the Constitution. I will say generally that the obligations of the prosecution are greater than the obligations of the defendant. Right? So, for instance, um, the prosecution must disclose to the defendant uh, in most jurisdictions any evidence that it intends to use in its case in chief. A defendant must be able to review the evidence and prepare for trial. The prosecution must disclose any prior statements of any witness it intends to call. Why? Because those prior statements could be used to impeach a witness if she testifies differently on the stand. The timing of that production varies by jurisdiction, but those prior statements of witnesses usually must be produced. Any 
very famous Supreme Court case in the United States, Brady versus Maryland, provides that any exculpatory evidence must be produced by the prosecution. So as a prosecutor, uh, as a prosecutor, if I am aware of any evidence that tends to show the defendant did not commit the crime, I must produce that in discovery. Right? Um, certainly, if there are any expert witnesses, so in the Chauvin case, there were expert witnesses testifying as to, for instance, the cause of death, right? Those sorts of things. If there are any expert witnesses, those reports of experts and the evidence or documents that they relied on, their resume or their CV, these things must be produced so that the other side can prepare for examination of this expert witness. So there's quite a number of things that must be produced on the prosecution side in a criminal case. The defendant does have discovery obligations, but I will say that those are much more limited um, both as a legal matter and really as a practical matter, right? As a legal matter, those discovery obligations are limited because a defendant has rights against self-incrimination, does not have to produce to the prosecution any incriminating evidence, right? Um, so, so there are obligations of a defendant, but they are more limited. For instance, if the defense is going to call any witnesses, the timing of disclosure of those prior witness statements may be much later. Right? Maybe as a prosecutor, I get handed some prior witness statements as the witness is testifying. You know, So I must review the statements over the break and see if there's any impeaching statements in the, in the reports. So there are an expert witnesses. Certainly a defendant must produce reports of an expert witness. So there's time to prepare for those things. So there are some discovery obligations of a defendant, but they, they are much less than the discovery obligations on the prosecution. And that is, you know, I suppose not just a defendant's right against self-incrimination, but really how we view the roles of the prosecutor's office and the role of the defendant, you know, and and part of how we view the role of the prosecutor's office is um, is not to convict a particular defendant, but more broadly to ensure that justice is done. And so transparency in the production of evidence and the disclosure of material is part of that obligation of a prosecutor's office. É, professora, professora Garner, a senhora fez referência aqui há pouco sobre a, a Double Jeopardy Clause, que aqui no Brasil a gente se refere, a, a, até usamos essa terminologia em inglês, a gente fala a princípio do nebis in idem processual, da, da vedação da persecução penal múltipla. Mas o, o meu questionamento à senhora, em relação ao caso Chauvin, a uh, Chauvin, se seria possível que ele fosse processado no âmbito federal, se existe essa possibilidade, por, a senhora comentou inclusive durante a sua exposição sobre a violação aí do civil rights, então se por conta dessa violação ele também poderia ser processado no âmbito federal, então gostaria de saber, porque a senhora comentou que por conta da Double Jeopardy Clause, que ele se absolvido, não poderia haver um recurso da acusação para que ele fosse submetido a novo julgamento perante a justiça estadual. Mas o meu questionamento é se pelo homicídio, pela morte do George Floyd, ele pode ser processado tanto no âmbito estadual como também no âmbito federal pelo US Department of Justice. Yes, so um, the Supreme Court of the United States has interpreted our double jeopardy clause to require that there be three conditions. Number one, that it be prosecution by the same sovereign. Number two, that it, that it be prosecution for the same offense. And number three, that it be prosecution after jeopardy has attached. So that would be 
uh, uh, impanelment or swearing in of a jury in a criminal case. So that first requirement that it be prosecution by the same sovereign is never met in the instance of prosecution by federal authorities after a state prosecution. It, it could be further that the prosecution by federal authorities is for a, a different offense, right? A civil rights violation requires different elements than a murder or manslaughter conviction. But even if it were an offense that had precisely the same elements or no different elements, there is no bar to subsequent prosecution by federal authorities after a state conviction. Now, as a practical matter, even though there is no legal bar to it, in most cases, there is not a subsequent prosecution by federal authorities. Um, there, there are uh, policies of prosecutors' offices that guide these determinations. And in most instances, if that earlier prosecution, if the state prosecution has served justice, you know, then there is no reason to devote federal resources to a subsequent prosecution of the very same individual who perhaps is already serving a state sentence that may fully satisfy what justice requires. So even though there is no legal bar to subsequent federal prosecution, in most cases, federal authorities would um, would demur, would, would not pursue prosecution for an individual who has been fully prosecuted by the state. Now, that's not true in all instances. So federal prosecution is pursued. Um, at one very famous instance is in the American system was regarding uh, the Rodney King beating. So this was some decades ago. Um, and it was actually one of the first instances when uh, an individual citizen recorded an interaction between a suspect and the police in the United States. And it was shown on this video that Mr. King, uh, who was being stopped for uh, driving under the influence, he was driving erratically, he was stopped and removed from his vehicle and he was subsequently beaten very badly by the police officers. Those police officers were tried in state court in California and they were acquitted. And that resulted in riots in California. And so there was a subsequent federal prosecution because it was believed that the state court prosecution had failed to serve justice in that instance. Right? Now, in the instance of Officer Chauvin and these officers, there is a federal investigation that is occurring. I believe that's a matter of public record. And it is believed that federal charges will be returned irrespective of the conviction. So even though Officer Chauvin was not acquitted, he was convicted of all charges against him. Um, the belief is that um, that federal prosecution is neat. Well, I can't speak to what the federal authorities are doing because I'm not part of the Department of Justice anymore. But it, it's believed that the Department of Justice wishes to pursue prosecution despite the convictions to really um, to, to take a stand against uh, violations of civil civil liberties and um, uh, really to show the public that this is a case that is worthy of prosecution by federal authorities and prosecution to the fullest extent. So, um, so in this instance, it would not be to um, to uh, accommodate a failing in the state system. It would be to uh, supplement uh, the state system, really. É, professora Gardner, talvez assim, é, fugindo um pouco da, da questão jurídica dos debates, mas eu acho que eu não, não poderia de aproveitar a oportunidade para perguntar à senhora, com toda a experiência que a senhora tem,
sobre essa questão da, da, da violência policial, sobretudo envolvendo discussões quanto a, a um possível racismo. A senhora já comentou sobre o caso, quer dizer, nós estamos debatendo o caso George Floyd, a senhora lembrou agora o caso Rodney King, né? a senhora já citou aqui também, não seria, pelo menos na minha visão, uma questão de violência policial, o caso do O.J. Simpson, que também foi um caso muito rumoroso, mas é, gostaria de, de perguntar à senhora sobre a, a, a visão que a senhora tem, por mais que o nosso tempo seja curto, sobre essa questão da, da violência policial, sobretudo envolvendo aí a, o racismo. This is, um, this is such an important issue in the United States right now, and it has been an issue in the United States for many, many years. I will say that it is, it is not an easy question to answer because I believe it implicates, it involves really the, the history of this country, um, not just slavery of African Americans, but even after um, uh, slaves were freed and African Americans were given rights of citizenship and the right to vote, there existed in this country for many decades what we call Jim Crow laws, essentially official segregation um, of, uh, of racial minorities, including Blacks, and further, that even though rights to vote were granted to racial minorities, there uh, has existed, and I think really, frankly, exists to this day, um, uh, systems in place and practices that in many instances deny or suppress minority votes in this country. So the question implicates the history of the United States, which for hundreds of years has been, uh, you know, frankly, and I'm a very proud American, but frankly, we have a very racist, somewhat segregated, right, society. And so, That history informs so much, I think, of what is going on right now. And I will say, um, in this country, there are also economic disparities uh, and social disparities that contribute to these things. So in many of our urban centers, in many of our cities, um, uh, citizens are poorer. There are more racial minorities in those areas, right? Um, and as a consequence, um, there, there are interactions, there's a relationship between the police and between citizens in those areas that is very much different than the relationship that citizens have with police in suburbs or in other areas, you know. Um, the experience, I mean, being Uh, someone who resided in Los Angeles for 38 years and was a prosecutor there for 11 years, I will say that the experience of many in the city in Los Angeles or in uh, more urban areas of the city, the experience is one that has fostered a, a distrust of the police, you know. Police are not seen by the citizens as individuals who are helping society. They're seen by the citizens as individuals who are hurting society. And so um, that, that relationship and the, that dynamic that has developed as a result of uh, racism, both structural racism and individual racism, but further that has developed really because of socioeconomic circumstances of this country and of urban areas of this country. It, it has created um, uh, a lot of strife, you know, a lot of um, uh, pain really for a lot of people in this country. And, and what we do about that is, is unclear. 
to us. You know, there is discussion of uh, dismantling police forces, right, in some of the urban areas and uh, switching to a system of community policing. Right? Some are very, very much in favor of that. Right? Some see that as um, a recipe for disaster, you know, that crime will just proliferate in those areas and ultimately that will end up hurting the very citizens that we're trying to help in the process. Um, so, you know, re police reform is something that is very much um, uh, a topic in this country and on the minds of many people, but I don't think that police reform can be considered in isolation or separate from the social and economic circumstances that that contribute to the need for police reform. So it's a it's a very um, cha just to be frank, it's a very challenging time in the United States, and it's a very difficult issue. And even individuals who have shared goals in mind, you know, even individuals who wish to dismantle racism, uh, those individuals may have very different ideas about how we are to accomplish it, you know. So um, so it's a, an issue that we continue to struggle with, and I think will for some period of time. Professora Gardner, gostaríamos de ficar aqui o tempo, muito mais tempo, o dia inteiro, suas reflexões brilhantes, esse é um momento ímpar para todos nós aqui. Gostaríamos de agradecer eternamente a senhora por essa oportunidade também, ao professor Renato, à conselheira Fernanda Marinella por essa oportunidade, né? Mas, infelizmente, a gente sabe que a sua agenda também é uma agenda apertada aqui nos Estados Unidos, professora. Então, eu gostaria de agradecer a todos a presença, antes de passar para as suas ponderações finais, e depois encaminhar para o Diego e, e para a conselheira finalizar o nosso evento, agradecer a todos, a todos aqueles, aqueles e aquelas que estão nos assistindo pelas, pelas plataformas, né? Agradecer também, eu não eu poderia deixar de agradecer ao amigo e colega de, de Ministério Público, Dr. Pedro Abiasab, que fez esse contato inicial com a, com a unidade nacional de, do MP, e agradecer muito pela presença e por essa oportunidade ímpar. Então, eu, eu gostaria de primeiro passar a palavra para o professor Renato, para as suas colocações finais, o professor, na sequência, para a professora Shannon Gardner, e depois o nosso nosso anfitrião, Diego Barbiero, membro auxiliar no CNMP, também o proceder para o encaminhamento final a todos e e a todos, muito muito obrigado. É, professora Gardner, foi um foi uma grande honra, um grande prazer participar desse evento. Gostaria de agradecer a senhora. O Samuel já havia dito que a senhora é uma excelente professora e aqui uma hora poderíamos ficar uma manhã, uma tarde inteira escutando a senhora. Foi um enorme aprendizado. Resta a mim agora, então, pensar, às vezes, no mestrado, né? Estava até conversando com o Samuel, né? O difícil vai ser, professora Gardner, é, ir para Syracuse com aí três crianças pequenas. Uhum. Meu menor está com oito meses, mas certamente seria um grande aprendizado poder ser aluno aí da senhora. Então, gostaria de agradecer a senhora pelo seu tempo, pelas suas palavras e agradecer também a todos os colegas aí do Ministério Público, na pessoa da nossa querida doutora Fernanda Marinella, que nos deu essa oportunidade de termos essa manhã para poder aprender um pouco mais sobre o sistema criminal norte-americano. Muito obrigado, professora Gardner. Thank you so much. This was this was such an honor for me and such a pleasure. So I thank all of you um, for for your interest in this, and I thank all of you for the opportunity for this dialogue. I really appreciate it, and I really enjoyed seeing all of you this morning. Bom, conselheira Fernanda Marinella, professora Gardner, doutor Renato Brasileiro, doutor Samuel, doutor Brian, a excelência desse evento confirma o protagonismo da Unidade Nacional de Capacitação do Ministério Público, sob a presidência da conselheira Fernanda Marinella, 
no aprimoramento funcional dos membros do Ministério Público Nacional. É, são temas de grande relevância e interesse à carreira do Ministério Público, trazidos ao debate tanto dos membros do MP como de toda a comunidade. Como membro auxiliar, eu só tenho a agradecer à conselheira Fernanda Marinella pelas oportunidades que a Unidade Nacional de Capacitação proporciona a todos os membros do MP, aos expositores de hoje, a professora Gardner, o professor Renato Brasileiro, o doutor Samuel, ao doutor Pedro Abiesab, que possibilitou a aproximação da unidade com o doutor Samuel e a professora Gardner, e especialmente né, a brilhante equipe da Unidade é, Nacional de Capacitação, os promotores Munique e Dani, servidora Olga, Aline, o Vladimir, e aos demais integrantes da equipe técnica do CNMP. Com esse sentimento de gratidão e felicidade pelo êxito do evento, eu devolvo a palavra à conselheira Fernanda Marinella para que faça o encerramento, então, oficial do nosso evento. Bom, mais uma vez, eu fiquei aqui deslumbrada com os ensinamentos. Professora Gardner, a senhora é brilhante, com tanta clareza, com tanta didática, com tanta propriedade, nos esclareceu elementos importantes que precisam ser, inclusive, alguns debatidos internamente no país, para que possamos ter um ordenamento jurídico cada vez mais uh, perfeito na efetivação da justiça, e é isso que nós buscamos todos os dias. Então, professora, muito obrigada pela sua contribuição, pela sua disponibilidade e pelos ensinamentos a todos os brasileiros. Bom, espero que a gente tenha outras oportunidades como essa de recebê-la no Brasil e espero que a pandemia passe para que a senhora possa vir presencialmente ao Brasil. Será uma grande honra recebê-la aqui. Queria agradecer ainda ao professor Renato Brasileiro, que sempre vem uh, contribuindo com a Unidade Nacional de Capacitação. Professor Renato, suas com, as suas comparações, né, a sua colocação com relação ao ordenamento jurídico brasileiro, fica muito mais rica a, a conversa, o nosso diálogo, de hoje, então muito obrigada pelos seus ensinamentos e pela disponibilidade também de estar conosco. Queria agradecer aos promotores e aqui contribuição então do Dr. Samuel, Dr. Samuel muito obrigada, Dr. Diego por ter formatado e feito toda a execução desse evento, agradecendo também aos nossos parceiros, nosso evento ele está sendo realizado em conjunto com a Escola Superior da Advocacia Nacional, também em conjunto com o Conselho Nacional de Justiça e, uh, portanto, agradecer aos nossos parceiros pela confiança e pela oportunidade. Agradeço ainda a toda a equipe da Unidade Nacional de Capacitação, agradecendo os nossos membros auxiliares, o Dani, a Larissa, a Monique, agradecendo ao Diego, agradecendo também as nossas, aos nossos colaboradores, o Vladimir, a Olga, a Aline, toda a equipe do Conselho Nacional do Ministério Público e eu não poderia deixar de agradecer ao Dr. Brian, que também foi conosco aqui, o nosso tradutor desse diálogo tão importante e que também representa a advocacia brasileira. Então, agradecer a todos que permitiram a realização desse evento e que acompanharam, então, esses ensinamentos e que possamos, então, continuar aperfeiçoando o sistema brasileiro de justiça e buscando melhores soluções para o nosso ordenamento. Obrigada a todos.